Hi. Today we're going to do a very quick movie to talk about graphs and how they relate to Faraday's law. And so our single goal is simply to learn how to interpret a flux, magnetic flux, versus time graph. Okay, so here's a graph of magnetic flux as a function of time. So the flux starts off at minus 4 Weber's, that's minus 4 tesla, per, uh, tesla meter squared. And then it uh, gradually increases, well, I guess it gradually goes from minus 4, in fact, to 0, and then from 0 up to plus 4. That whole process takes 20 seconds. Then for the next 10 seconds, from t equals 20 seconds to t equals 30, the flux is constant at 4 Weber's, positive 4, and then between 30 and 50 seconds you see a decrease from 4 Weber's to 2 Weber's. Okay, so we have a graph of magnetic flux through a conducting loop. Okay, and the units in fact are Weber's, but they are equivalent to Tesla meter squared. And let's say that the flux in the loop changes because it's the magnetic field passing through the loop chain that uh, is changing. And the loop itself is stationary and has a fixed area. Okay, That doesn't matter too much, the details, but maybe it's nice to know exactly how we're producing this change in flux. Okay, so we want to investigate induced current. Okay, so here we have a graph of flux versus time and we're going to talk about current. And in fact, the first question is, the induced current in the loop has a larger magnitude at t equals 5 seconds, t equals 10 seconds, or neither, it's equal at those times. Okay, so first of all, we've got to connect current to flux versus time, right? So how do we do that? Well, we know that current is connected to voltage. Ohm's law gets us that connection. And then Faraday's law tells us that there's a connection between voltage and flux, magnetic flux. If you change magnetic flux as a function of time, you can generate a voltage. Okay, so that's our basic connection. So Ohm's law says induced current is going to be proportional to induced voltage. And Faraday's law tells us that the induced voltage is proportional to the rate of change with respect to time of magnetic flux. So that tells us the induced current is therefore proportional to the time rate of change of magnetic flux. Okay, so we have delta flux over delta t in our equation, and what we have is a flux versus time graph. So how do we get delta flux over delta t? Well, it's the slope. Okay, so that thing that's proportional to the induced current is actually the slope of the flux versus time graph. So when we're asked about current, we want to think about slope. And so at t equals 5 and t equals 10 seconds, in fact, the whole time between t equals 0 and t equals 20 seconds, the slope is constant. That is a straight line going all the way from minus 4 at t equals 0 to plus 4 at t equals 20 seconds, constant slope. So the induced current that whole time has the same magnitude. So it's equal at t equals 5 and t equals 10. Now note that the graph is actually going through 0, right? The flux is equal to 0 at t equals 10. Don't let yourself be fooled by that. The actual value, what the flux is at that particular time, isn't relevant. It's how quickly is the flux changing as it passes through that time. And it's changing just as quickly at t equals 5 as it is at t equals 10. Okay, So the slope's the same. We don't care what the actual value is of the flux. We just worry about what is the slope. Okay, so let's try another one. How about this? Induced current in the loop has a larger magnitude at t equals 5 seconds or t equals 25 seconds. Okay, so you can get fooled again by the graph by saying, well, t equals 25 seconds, the flux is 4, 
Weber's at t equals 5 seconds. The flux is, mm, it's minus 2, isn't it? Okay, so 4 is a lot bigger than minus 2, but you're getting fooled by the graph. Okay, what you want to do again is focus on slope. Right, we have again this relationship, induced current is proportional to delta flux over delta t, and if you have a flux versus time graph, delta flux over delta t is change in y over change in x, change in what's on the vertical axis divided by change in what's on the horizontal axis. That is the slope. So you compare the slopes at t equals 5 and t equals 25. And so despite the fact that the flux is a lot higher at t equals 25 than it is at t equals 5, the uh, slope is bigger at t equals 5 seconds. Okay, so the induced current is larger at t equals 5 than at t equals 25. And of course, we can make a stronger statement than that. In fact, there is no induced current at all at t equals 25 seconds because the slope of the graph is zero. Okay, what about current direction? What can we tell about current direction? So let's say we're given this information. The direction of the induced current in the loop is clockwise at t equals 5 seconds. In what direction is the induced current at other times? Okay. So, again, we want to think about slope. Okay, so let's examine our equations a little bit more. So the induced current is proportional to the induced voltage, the induced EMF. And the induced EMF is equal to, this is Faraday's law here, minus n times delta flux over delta t. Okay, so in fact the sign of the slope is going to give you the sign of the current, and the sign of the current is telling you about the direction of the current. Okay, so the sign of the slope gets you the direction of the current. And so at t equals 5 seconds, we know the induced current is clockwise, we were told that, and the slope at t equals 5, in fact at all points between t equals 0 and t equals 20 seconds, the slope is positive. The graph is going up. Okay, so we can say that the current is clockwise. It's the same at t equals 5 as it is at all points between t equals 0 and t equals 20 seconds. Then there's no current at all for the next 10 seconds because the slope is 0. And then between t equals 30 and t equals 50, the slope of the graph is negative. Okay, so if you have clockwise current when the slope is positive, you therefore have counterclockwise current when the slope is negative. Okay, so all, you can get an awful lot of information about, out of the slope of the graph just by thinking of the slope. Okay, so let's do one last uh, slide here on doing something quantitative. We'll actually do a calculation using this graph. Okay, so we need to know a few things. So let's say we're given the following information. Our loop, this is a single turn loop, has a resistance of one tenth of an ohm, 0 0.10 ohms. It happens to have an area of three square meters. We want to know the magnitude of the current in the loop at t equals 15 seconds. We actually already know the direction, right? Because we were told earlier that at t equals five seconds, the current is clockwise. So at t equals 15 seconds, it's the same. It's also clockwise because the slope is exactly the same at t equals 15 as it is at t equals 5. Same sign and even same magnitude. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this. So we got to first pull out Faraday's law. Okay, so here's one thing we can do. We can say uh, we're given a value for n. That's one, consists of a single turn. And we got to figure out what the actual slope is, right? Delta flux over delta t represents the slope. And slope where? Well, at t equals 15. That's where we're interested in the current. So we want to know the induced voltage at t equals 15 first. And we'll connect that to current in a minute with Ohm's law, in fact. Okay, so think about what, what the slope is there. t equals 15 seconds. How do you calculate the slope? And so you can do rise over run. Okay, so one thing you might do is notice that the slope is the same at t equals 15 as it is over the whole 0 to 20 second interval. So you can use that full interval if you want, do rise over run. You could do a sub part of that interval. 
you could do say that t equals 20 seconds, the flux is 4 Weber's, t equals 10 seconds, the flux is 0. So my change in flux is plus 4 Weber's divided by my time interval, which was 10 seconds. Okay, hmm, that's good. A little out of order there, but we'll come back to that. That's our conclusion here, but we'll get there in a minute. Okay, so back to Faraday's law. Here's our plus 4 tesla meters squared over 10 seconds. You could have done all the way from 0 to 20, then you'd get a change of uh, ending at 4, starting at minus 4, plus 8 tesla meters squared over 20 seconds. That's the same as 4 over 10. Okay, so the induced EMF comes out to minus 0 0.4 volts. We're not really too worried about the minus sign because we're asked about the magnitude of the current. So the sign really doesn't matter much when we're talking about magnitude. Okay, so now we know the induced voltage in the, in the coil. How do we find current? Well, we use Ohm's law. So we're given the resistance. Now we just calculated the voltage. We can get the current from Ohm's law, voltage over resistance. Minus 0 0.4 over 0 0.10 ohms. Again, the, the minus sign really doesn't matter too much. Comes out to 4 amps. So the magnitude is 4 amps. And one thing to note is that we were given the area here and we didn't need to know it. Okay, to calculate some other things we might need to know area, but to calculate current, all we needed was the slope of the flux graph, which we were able to read off the graph. Uh, we needed a particular time because we wanted to know, you know, where where we're going to take the slope off that graph, and we also needed to know the resistance because we needed to connect voltage to to current. Okay, so sometimes we're given information we don't don't need, and this is one of those cases. Okay, so that is all for our quick look at um, graphical interpretations of Faraday's law and Lenz's law.